Coming up, a shocking jailhouse confession of murder from a Racetic mom. Why she says she had to kill her kids. Plus, with racial tensions rising and a potential verdict in the Derek Chauvin case next week, what's Southern California's plan to deal with potential riots here? LA County Sheriff Alex Villanueva joins us live to talk about that and his contentious relationship with LA County DA George Gascon. You're watching Fox 11 News Special Report. And good evening. Welcome to Fox 11 News Special Report. This is a big night around here. I'm Alex Michelson. Marla Tejas is off tonight. And one of my best friends, one of the best reporters in town, Bill Malusian, is filling in for the very first time. Bill, great it, to have you here. It's great to be. I'm so used to hearing you in my ear from out in the field. It's weird to like <laughs> be here in, in studio with you, but uh, excited to be here. Thanks for having me. And uh, it's going to be a fun show. We got LA County Sheriff Alex Villanueva coming up here in just a couple minutes. Plenty of, plenty of things to talk about here in LA and across the country. We'll get to that in uh, just a couple minutes here. Yeah, and one of those big stories is some shocking new details in the murder of three young kids in Reseda. It is an interview that happened in the Kern County Jail. Liliana Carrillo told a reporter that, yeah, I did kill hurt my kids. And she explained why she made that decision. Yeah, pretty uh, astonishing interview there. One that I'm not sure her public defender is going to be too thrilled about. We got Phil Schumann joining us live tonight at the scene of the crime. Phil, what's the latest on this? Well, when we first heard about the shocking murders of uh, Joanna, Terry, Sienna, and then the allegation that the mother did it, we all no doubt had the same reaction. How could she? Well, today, she actually tried to explain it. I drowned them. That's what Liliana Carrillo told a Bakersfield TV reporter. Do I wish I didn't have to do that? Yes. But I prefer them not being tortured and abused on a regular basis for the rest of their lives. I did it as softly. I don't know how to explain it, but I hugged them and I kissed them, and I was apologizing the whole time. That was Carrillo speaking from a Bakersfield courthouse jail cell. That's where she fled after she says she drowned her three children inside this Reseda apartment building, where today an elaborate memorial continues to grow for Joanna, three, Terry, two, and Sierra, six months. Attorney Alexandra Kazarian reviewed that interview for Fox 11. I saw a very sick woman who I honestly believe is living in a reality that we don't live in. People that are living in a, a disordered reality and who act on those disorders, there is a path uh, called, you know, not guilty by reason of insanity. Though Carrillo says she struggled with postpartum depression, marijuana, and thoughts of suicide, she said she was, quote, completely sober when she killed her children. The father and mother involved in a bitter custody battle, she apparently claiming he was abusing the eldest. He said he reached out numerous times to the Los Angeles County Department of Children and Family Services, warning she was a danger to the children. They can only work with the information that they get. And I don't believe in any of the paperwork the father ever said, I believe that my wife is going to kill my children. The DCFS continues to refuse requests to discuss this case, citing California's confidentiality laws. Carrillo has not yet been charged with the murders of her children, but she did say in that interview, Bill and Alex, that it's something that she's accepted and she's prepared to spend the rest of her life in prison. That's assuming that she's charged and the prosecutors do not ask for the death penalty. And Phil Biden, she I'm Phil Schumann, Fox 11 News, yes. And she talked about the fact that she was considering killing herself, right? Right. She actually said that she considered driving off a cliff. Remember, she was captured in the Bakersfield area after driving away from Southern California, and apparently a car got stuck on the side of the road. So instead, she carjacked someone, which is the charge she's actually in custody for at the moment. All right. What a case. Phil Schumann, thank you. Joining us now to talk more about that and other cases is the sheriff of L.A. County, Alex Villanueva. Sheriff, welcome back to the show. Uh, thank you both. All right, uh, so what we saw there is a jailhouse interview, which is not something that we typically see in L.A. County. What did you make of what she said and the fact that they allow jailhouse interviews in Kern County? Well, I'd, I'd be very curious, um, running a jail system myself, how it got to that point where she was, they had the access to interview her and whether or not she had asserted a right to counsel or not. Those are questions that are going to have to be addressed. Uh, 
course. And then the, the content of what she said is alarming. And perhaps even more alarming is the fact that she might face greater consequences for the carjacking in Kern County than the triple homicide in Los Angeles County. And that is that is a sad state of affairs. And Sheriff, as we get ready for a potential ruling in the Derek Chauvin case this coming week, um, you know, I talked to you on Monday. We're expecting maybe some potential unrest here in Los Angeles. Um, you told me you guys are trying to learn from what happened with the George Floyd unrest last summer. A lot of stuff went wrong here in L.A. Um, one of the things you said is you're, you're going to try to fix up jurisdictional issues. And I understand there were some issues in Santa Monica last summer. Can you can you elaborate on exactly what happened and what you're going to fix? Well, we had the resources within the sheriff's department. We assisted on a request for, a, for mutual aid from Santa Monica. However, once we deployed our resources, they're not being used effectively because they were in one end of the city in the south end where there was a skirmish line, but all the looting that was going on was going on, and the vandalism was in the promenade to the north. So it was not a very effective use of our resources. So we figured we're going to resolve this issue is we're going to send our personnel anywhere in the county, wherever there's looting, rioting, arson, vandalism, and we're definitely going to stop it. We're going to assist our local law enforcement agencies in their efforts, but we're not going to let any situation get out of control anywhere in the county. I don't care where it is. Did Santa Monica PD want your help last year? Oh, they asked for our help, but it... It, it was misused at the time. And as you saw, the, a lot of the business owners are very, very angry by the response of Santa Monica Police Department. I don't think it, then it had, it's a question about command and control of the resources that were disposed, uh, available for their use. And uh, that uh, definitely did not work to their advantage. How concerned are you about next week? And, and what specifically is the plan? Are we looking at increased staffing? We, uh, well, we have definitely a staffing model that gives us more resources. We put all of our, our people that wear civilian attire, we're putting them in uniforms, all of our detective division, our station detectives. We have uh, two mobile field forces entirely, one that's already available to roll at any time, another one from our patrol personnel that are on reserve. We can deploy them everywhere. We have a, a multiple of uh, sheriff's response teams. Those are the ones you see in a lot of the... Uh, civil unrest period where they're dressed in all the tactical gear with all the padding and the helmets, there you go. And that to crowd, they're very well equipped, they're very well trained, and they did a wonderful job at separating peaceful protesters from people that are intent on doing harm. And we're gonna aim to, to separate the wheat from the chaff. So what are your marching orders going to be to your, your deputies out there on the street? You indicated on Monday that you're concerned about how our new district attorney might or might not prosecute looting, vandalism, that sort of a thing. What do you tell your street deputies um, if they do make an arrest? Are you worried there might not be a, a prosecutorial fist behind it? That is definitely a legitimate concern because if there's a lack of the prosecutorial fist, that might actually embolden some of our Antifa anarchist crowd, or the radical elements to try to hijack peaceful protests for their own personal gain or their own agendas. And if they feel like they're not going to face any serious consequence, that, that is a big problem. That is something that the district attorney himself is going to have to answer to. So what you said earlier in our interview when you were suggesting that there might be more charges for carjacking than for the murders, that was a bit of an acknowledgement that George Gascon is the district attorney in Los Angeles and there's a different district attorney up in Kern County. Um, yes. What is the nature of your relationship right now with the district of Atter attorney uh, George Gascon, are you even on speaking terms? I've had one phone call with him since uh, he's taken office. It was a, a practical issue. We had to uh, coordinate some effort on a case, and that has been it. Everything else has been, uh, he issues his, uh, he brought down his uh, Ten Commandments, the tablets from the mountain, the special directives, and expects the entire world to just uh, go with it. Somehow it's going to work. Well, it's not working. It has dire consequences for victims of crime. For, for example, when we presented 12 cases of solicitation for prostitution, he dismissed them all, refused to file them. He's basically um, legalized prostitution in Los Angeles County by not, by not following through on his job as the district attorney. So there's so many consequences to the decision he's making. They're very far-reaching. And I don't think the public is, is just now starting to understand, yes, there is consequence 
when you eliminate consequences for the criminal community. I mean, that, what you just said there is a pretty remarkable thing, that the sheriff of L.A. County and the district attorney of L.A. County don't even speak to one another. How does that impact crime, and how do we fix that? How do your two agencies work together? Well, when he took office, and I made it very clear, I want him to succeed as a district attorney. And there's ways that we can reform the criminal justice system, the place that need to be fixed. Yes, by all means, we can do that. But there's a way to do it properly where you incorporate all the stakeholders, the state legislature, what involves, obviously, uh, the enforcement of the, you know, the different, uh, the scheme, the regulatory scheme we have in the, with the penal code, for example. And he found head on when he tried to uh, change or uh, nullify this three strikes law. He was sued and he lost in court. The judge told him, no, you have to follow three strikes. That is a requirement. It's not an option for you to interpret it your own way. So we want him to be successful, but it can't come at the expense of public safety and at the expense of victims of crime. And that's where I have to draw that firm line in the sand. Mm. And Sheriff, one last quick question for you, quick answer. Um, what's your message to Angelinos out there who are feeling uneasy this week ahead of this, this verdict? and they're worried about a repeat of what we saw last summer. What do you want to say to the people you serve? Well, we, every, all of our jurisdictions, there was no harm, and gratefully, we assisted other jurisdictions. We put a stop to it so we didn't become Seattle or Portland or all this Minnesota, the places we see constantly played out on TV. We're able to vo avoid the worst of the worst, but we're gonna strive to do better this time around, and we want to encourage people that protest peacefully, do so in daylight, in places that are uh, acceptable for that. But when the sun falls and all you see are people dressed with helmets and shields and frozen bottles of water and rocks, if you're in that crowd and you think you're a peaceful protester, you're not. You need to leave when you see that. Walk away and we'll deal with the people left behind. Sheriff Alex Nueva, thanks for coming on and sharing your views. Thank you, Sheriff. All right, you got it. Thank you both. And by the way, we have reached out to George Gascone multiple times over months, inviting him to come onto this program and have a conversation and share his views. For the last several months, they have denied that request. Up next, my conversation today with Congresswoman Barbara Lee. She was the only person to vote against the Afghanistan war back in 2001. What does she say now that it is ending and later? We take you behind the scenes of Bill Malusian's award-winning investigation. Stay with us. You are watching the Fox 11 News Special Report. Welcome back to Fox 11 News Special Report. Marla is off tonight, and we are joined by Bill Malusian. Ellis, good to be with you, sir. The U.S. is working to set up a national network to track different COVID variants. The Biden administration plans to set aside $1.7 billion from the most recent relief package. The national network features three specific components. Number one, a boost in funding for the CDC. Number two, the creation of a six partnership center with universities to improve research. And number three, a data system to share and analyze different threats. Tonight on our political show, The Issue Is, I talk with Democratic Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Among the issues we discuss, the end of the war in Afghanistan. Remember, she, back in 2001, was the only member of Congress to vote against it. If we don't leave, we'll be there another 20 years and our troops will be in harm's way. Let me tell you, uh, we have uh, orderly, uh, and the military has a plan for the orderly transition uh, of our troops out of there. And in fact, we have to use those tools in our toolbox in terms of diplomacy and development and provide for humanitarian assistance. And we've trained hundreds of thousands of uh, Afghani uh, troops who can uh, provide the security, of course, will respond if necessary. More from Congresswoman Lee and L.A. Times columnist Elsie Granderson on the issue is tonight at 1030. Up next, we get to know my buddy Bill here a little bit better. We talk about his investigations and we're going to have some fun, too. Maybe even some surprises. Oh, God. Stay with us. <laughs> We know that you had sick dogs before that have died. We could have been okay. and yeah. I, and we know that you've promised to stop doing this, and yes, here we are again. But now I'm doing it legally. You're not yet, though. Okay, I understand that, but I'm not selling sick dogs, sir. 
Fox 11 has been investigating Gustavo Gonzalez for more than two years. Oh, we have this guy again. I'm not talking to a new student. Do you remember us, Gustavo? Do you remember uh, all the lies I... you gave us last time? He's inmate number 5650933. That was Bill Malusian exposing a man who was selling sick dogs to people on Craigslist. His work on the Sick Puppy Peddler series won an Emmy Award, led to the arrest of Gustavo Gonzalez. Uh, since we have Bill inside for a change, <laughs> we decided yeah. to take a moment to get to know him a little bit better and to talk about investigative reporting a little bit as well. You've won so many awards. I know that is one of your uh, most proud stories. And I'm wondering, Bill, where does that passion for investigative reporting come from? What made you want to do this? Well, well, first off, forget the awards. What really made me happy there was the fact he's still in, he's still in jail right now, um, locking, getting that guy locked up. That story made me more angry than perhaps any other story I've done because I'm a huge animal lover. And we just kept catching him over and over and over. He kept changing his name, kept promising he wasn't going to do it anymore. Um, karma caught up with him. But to answer your question, um, I just love shining light where other people don't want it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, those confrontations are 100% my most favorite part of the job, especially when um, we know what somebody's been doing. Somebody's been doing something wrong. Somebody's been you know, taking advantage of somebody, selling a sick dog, whatever it is. When we're, we're able to catch them and confront them about it and they get that deer in the headlights look in their face, um, it's one of the best parts of the job. And I do this job for investigative journalism. I started it in college and it sounds weird, but I love the grind of just staying up till three in the morning and going through mountains of documents and doing stories you're not gonna wake up and, and find on Instagram or on Twitter. Original reporting that people here in LA care about. Um, when people email you with a problem and say, please help me, um, that, that's the best part of the job. And when it all comes full circle and you help somebody, you expose something, um, that is why I do the job. Uh, yeah. You know, that's the passion. And we're looking at video right now of, of your story about Nutribullet, which won a Goldman mic uh, for a danger in the mix and led to changes there. And then uh, the two of us collaborated together on, on a story um, that made a lot of headlines, uh, <laughs> yeah. the, the Gavin Newsom story of uh, his time at the French Laundry. And, and we were the first to air these pictures, which have certainly changed up California politics. and. Um, I, I wondered, like, mindset-wise, when you see something like that and know that you have a story like that coming, sort of what goes through your mind? Well, I, I remember when we got these photos, you and I got them at the same time, and I think we both kind of had a, oh boy, here yeah. we go moment. <laughs> we both started making some calls, and um, I reached out to Newsom's office, you reached out to the person who, who, who took these photos, and I think... As soon as we saw it, we both kind of realized the political implications of what we were looking at there. Because remember, he was saying, it's outdoor. You know, it, I think everybody was kind of picturing they're under the stars on the grass or something. And you see a chandelier above their head like that and three walls. Um, doesn't exactly scream indoors. Yeah, it was hard to believe that, that he could have actually done that. Um, when I first yeah. saw it, I didn't, actually didn't think the picture was real. And then we found out that it was uh, very yeah. real. Um, you know, every once in a while, too, uh, we, we like to have some fun. There, there was one moment together that got a whole lot of attention. Uh, yeah. This was during the very serious moment of covering the riots, which was, which was such an emotional moment for, for all of us. But there was a moment that happened between the two of us on the air uh, where I have been mocked online <laughs> with about 10 million views. And so we want to show this and talk about the story behind this as well. P play this moment. Enough resources. The sheriff's deputies are going... And it's and it's okay. the sheriff's deputies yeah. are going up and down the up and down the streets. Look at that! Look at and that! A cinder look, block. That guy just stole a. Uh, or no, is that a? a no, it's not a cinder block. I think it's actually a, oh, a cat a cat tower. Oh, thing. there you yeah. go. Um, <laughs> okay. And they made sure yeah, they made that sure. was a that was a cat tower, <laughs> not so a random. cinder block. Uh, now, for, for my own, t the the monitor I was looking at was like this big, and we had actually seen somebody carrying a cinder block earlier in the yeah. day. Also was impressive was your reflexes there to be able to grab that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't oh, know what really that quickly. was. Th then the cat tower happened. And we, we got memed into oblivion. <laughs> I'm not on TikTok. I don't, I don't use it at all, but I've seen all the, uh, the views on it where we we're just getting clowned left and right. Uh, but uh, that, that was, <laughs> that was a, an interesting light moment in the middle yeah. of all that chaos. It was, uh, 
Uh, I, I still get I still get mocked on Twitter for it. Anytime I go to a breaking news story, someone will reply in my mentions. Uh, did did uh, PetSmart get hit? Is, is, is someone taking a cat tower? <laughs> yeah, uh, tens of millions of views, and now we're known as the, the cat tower guy. All right, um, and we also want to give a shout out, by the way, for the last year, um, reporters and photographers have been together uh, with the same crew basically for the last year during the lockdown. You posted this picture the other day of your photographer, Sam Dubin, and said, what do we call this album? <laughs> but, yeah. but Sam has been uh, really the unsung hero with you every single day working on all of these stories as well. Yeah, he's, he's become one of my best friends. We've been together literally every single day since the pandemic first began. He makes me look a lot better than I am. Uh, we, we got really good chemistry together. Every story I've done basically for the past year, anything you see on TV, he's mostly behind it. Hard-working guy, love working with him, and, uh, you know, he, he deserves just as much praise as anybody else. So what do you call the album? <laughs> Go on Instagram and look at some of the interesting <laughs> response. I thought we were going to get hit by trolls, and, you know, there were a few on there, but um, th there's some interesting, interesting posts there. Amanda Salas had her, her usual puns, you know? Okay, well, <laughs> you know... Part of my goal of tonight was to get you to smile on TV because nobody ever gets to see that. I know, it's rare. And you know I always like to dance on TV, too. So oh, uh, we've, got, we've got some Pharrell. I know you're feeling happy. It's a good night. <laughs> We're together. Let's see if you'll bust a move as you, we go to break. More you, after this. You know I can't do that. I'll, I'll do the no. Alex. Do some snaps. There we go. <laughs> I'm happy. I'll take that. <laughs> Clap a lot. We'll be right back. More of the special report. All right. Bill Malouge and I are unabashed mama's boys, and uh, we end with a shout out yep. to the great Audrey. But this, there's there your mom. What does your mom mean to you, Bill? Uh, she's my best friend, my biggest fan. Um, ever since my dad passed away, I think we've gotten even closer, if that was even possible. Um, I can't even explain how much I love her. And uh, every live shot, as soon as I'm done, my phone buzzes in my pocket, and it's usually her saying, fix your tie, get the powder <laughs> off your face, or good job, one of the three. My mom complained about my hair during the show tonight. <laughs> we love that. Yeah. Bill, I love you, brother. This love was you so too, fun, yep. and uh, hopefully they'll let us do it again sometime. Marla Tejas is back on Monday. We'll see you tonight for The Issue Is. Now to Extra and Billy Bush.